here to talk about Hazrat Sayyiduna Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullahi Ali. Hazrat sought permission to go to Baghdad and study there. His mother, she had inherited some wealth from her husband. She had 80 dinars. She reserved it for the education of her sons. So she distributed that among them and she said that because you are going on a long journey, in order that you don't waste this money, I will sew them in your sleeves. However, at the time of departure, she gave him one advice. She said, my, my son, always speak the truth, never tell a lie. Hazrat Rahmatullah Ali departed, left his mother, and he knew that maybe he might not see his family again because it was a long journey, and a caravan traveled from Jilan to Hamdan. After they left Hamdan towards Baghdad, they were attacked by a group of bandits, and the whole uh, caravan was looted. One of the bandits passed by Hazrat and he thought that this is a young man, he's got nothing, he looks poorly according to his cloak and his chadar. So he went past by and then he returned and he said, uh, young man, do you have any, anything on you? And Hazrat replied, yes I have. And he said, what do you have? I have 40 golden coins. My mother has sewed them for me in my sleeves. Are you sure? Are you telling the truth? Because everybody else I had not spoken the truth. And Hazrat said, yes, I am telling you the truth. Where are they? He said, over here. And he checked. And then he said, stand up, come with me. And he took him to the leader of the bandits. He said, why did you tell? You know, if you would have lied, you wouldn't have found out. Because nobody would check under the sleeves if there is something there or not. So Hazrat said, well, my mother instructed me upon my departure that always speak the truth and never lie. So uh, I did not want to break the covenant which I had made with my mother and disobey my mother and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. I had to speak the truth. You can take the money if you want. And the way and the manner in which Hazrat spoke was so beautiful that it captured the heart of the leader of the bandits. And he said, you are a young man. You still got a long life ahead of you. And you are speaking the truth. You don't care about the money which we will rob you. And I am growing old. I've got white beard now. I'm going to die any day. And I am busy in this robbery and in this uh, attacking people and robbing people. I shouldn't be doing this. And thank you very much. You have given me some nice advice and you have opened my eyes up. I'm doing tawbah. And he called upon all the bandits and they said, do tawbah and return the possessions of the caravan from whomsoever, whatever you have looted, give it back to them. So because of the sidq and truth of Hazrat Rahmatullah Ali at that young age, which was very critical, he needed that money. He knew that he's going to need it when he gets to Baghdad. But still, Hazrat spoke the truth. And because of his truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the caravan as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the tawfiq to the leader of the bandit and the rest of the bandits to do tawbah as well. This was his first step and this was his first test for Hazrat. Hazrat was born in the year 471 after Hijrah and passed away in the year 561 after Hijrah at the age of 90. From his father's side, he is from the progeny and children of Sayyiduna Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. And from his mother's side, he is from the family of and children of Sayyiduna Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because his lineage from his mother's side, his mother was Ummul Khair, Amatul Jabbar, Fatima, Binte Abdullah, al Sawma'i, al Zahid. And his relation and nasab goes to Imam Musa al Qadim, who was the son of Imam Ja'far al Sadiq, who was the son of Imam Muhammad al Baqir, and who was the son of Imam Zainul Abidin Ali ibn al Hussein, and who was the son of Sayyiduna Hussein ibn Ali. So from both sides he is a Sayyid. His mother was quite elderly at the time of his Viladat. It is said that she had reached the age of menopause. Meaning Hazrat was born when his mother was nearly 60 years old. And he was born in the area of Jilan. Is the name of an area in Tabristan, northern Iran. Hazrat grows up 
and because he is in a family who are farmers and they have fields and uh, they work in there, Hazrat also when he grew up after his basic education, Hazrat well also helped his family through the work of farming. It is said that he would work really hard, he would take the oxes and the cows to graze and then he would go into the field for cultivation as well. Among his karamat, it is narrated that once he was using the ox and working and suddenly the ox sp started to speak and it said that, Oh Abdul Qadir, you have not been created for this farming and cultivation. Allah wants to take some good work from you. Hazrat realized from there, thereafter requested his mother uh, if he could have permission to go to Baghdad. Baghdad at that time was the largest city throughout the whole world. And at that time it had nearly 2 million population in that city of Baghdad. And it was uh, regarded as the best city in the whole world, the most civilized city, because many rulers and kings had come into that city from Harun Rashid, Mamunur Rashid, Aminul Rashid and Mu'tasim Billah and at that time there was five Khulafa which came during the time while Hazrat was there. So the Khulafa Abbasiyah had brought that pomp and glory and luxury through of the city of Baghdad. At the same time there were many ulama at that time in the Baghdad city as well. At that time the famous university in Baghdad was the al Madrasatun Nizamiyah which was erected by Nizamul Mulk, the king. And uh, it was that madrasa from where Nuruddin Zangi rahmatullahi alayhi also graduated. And from that madrasa, Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi also came. And it was that madrasa in which Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi used to teach. Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi passed away in the year 505 after Hijrah. So uh, when Hazrat rahmatullahi alayhi traveled to Baghdad, that was near the end of the year of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi. Hazrat left Jilan with the permission of his mother in the year 488 after Hijrah at, at the age of 18. And he arrived here. And that was the same year in which Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, after teaching for a long time in the Madrasa Nizamul Mulk, he finally came to the conclusion that he wants to give up all this teaching and he wants to go a bit further and do something else. So for that reason, he had to leave everything and all the connection which he had. And he had to go away to a place where he was not known by anybody, stay in solitude and uh, you know, progress in the field of tasawwuf. He was a master in philosophy and also in Quran, Hadith, Tafsir, he had learned everything. But this field, there was, he was something which he needed to go in there. For that reason, he left Baghdad altogether, his family and everything. And he traveled through the desert of Tarsus and then to Sham and all that area. He stayed away for 10 years. Then he wrote Ihya Ulum al Din, that famous book, which changed the shape of the world and which uh, gave the answers and replies to many queries of the philosophers of that time. So Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, had left uh, in the year 488 and departed on that journey. And his brother Ahmad al-Ghazali, his elder brother, was now at this madrasa of Nizamul Mulk. Hazrat Piran Apeer rahmatullahi alayhi, takes permission from his mother and leaves uh, for Baghdad. The condition of Baghdad at that time is that it's filled with ulama and filled with lots of pomp and glory and luxury. However, life in Baghdad is not cheap. It's expensive. Everything is expensive. Whether it's rental costs, whether it's food, whether it's education, whether it's this, whether it's that, everything is expensive. And what is 40 dinar, 40 gold coin? Within a few days, everything is finished. And Hazrat has to go through some, some tests. Hazrat is not worried about that. When he has nothing to eat, he doesn't spread his hand out in front of anyone. He survives on meager provisions. Sometimes Hazrat has to go out on the outskirt and eat some uh, leaves to survive. Sometimes he said a few days passed by and I had not eaten anything. I was very very weak and I'm really hungry and I'm waiting for death as though I'm going to die anytime. And what happened? A person comes uh, with some takeaway and opens his food and he starts eating. And he looks at me and he realizes that this, man, this young man is hungry. So he calls me, said come. I said no, no, no. When he insisted, I went. So I started eating little, little, because I did not want to uh, re reduce his food. So he says, 
where are you from? You look like a Musafir traveler. And he said, I am from Jilan. And then he asked Hazrat, where are you from? And Hazrat said, I am also from Jilan. And then he asked, do you know uh, this young man called Abdul Qadir, he's come here from Jilan? And Hazrat said, I am that person. I am Abdul Qadir from Jilan. So he said, oh, oh, I've been looking for you for so many days. Your mother called me and she gave me eight dinars to hand them over to you. Now I came here, my expenses finished, and I had nothing left, and I only had your eight dinars. So I, I stayed hungry for three days when I could not take it any longer. I used your money to buy this food, so this food is yours, and I am your mehman now. <laughs> and with the rest of the dinar, he bought food, and he went to the ribat, and he distributed among those who were there. Hazrat used to see the condition of Baghdad, that there are wealthy people, they pray and fast, but at the same time, they do wrong things which they shouldn't be doing. The ulama are there, they speak, but there is no asar and effect in their speeches. The rulers are there, but they are fighting among themselves. There is so much chaos and infighting among the families of the kings and princes. And the whole society is in a chaos. And Hazrat's mind is boggled when he sees these things. And sometimes, many th times he thinks of leaving Baghdad and going back to Jilan or somewhere else. Now, he went through these hardships. And he stayed in the company of ulama, fuqaha, muhaddisin. And he learned, first he learned fiqh. And he learned the fiqh according to the madhab of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi. He also learned tafsir and hadith and also other masai. And he went on to be a master of 13 sciences related to the Arabic knowledge. Whether it's nahw, sarf, balagat, bayan, maani, badiyah, eloquency, etymology, hadith, tafsir, usul hadith, usul tafsir. And later on, when he started teaching, he would be a master and teacher in all those sciences. In the morning he's teaching this, afternoon he's teaching that, evening he's teaching this, one day he's teaching here, the other day he's teaching there. And after that, he went on and to become bayat to his shaykh called Shaykh Hamad al dabbas He was one of the prominent shuyukh of that time in Baghdad. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullahi Alayhi says that once I went out to Babul Halaba, the gate of Baghdad, and I was going to go away. So someone called me out. Where are you going? He pushed me and I fell. And he said, don't go out of Baghdad. Go back into Baghdad because people will benefit from you. People need you. You are a person who is needed by this city. Sheikh Abdul Qadir said, I am just going out of here because I want to protect my deen. So Sheikh Hamad al dabbas was that person. He said, you will get this protection of your deen and you will get extra as well. So stay here. So Sheikh Abdul Qadir says, I return. And after this encounter with Sheikh Hamad al dabbas many things opened up before me due to the tawajjuh and the attention of Sheikh Hamad al dabbas Sometimes I would go away from his company to for talabul ilm, for learning some fiqh, some masla masail. When I would come back to Shaykh, he would say, Why have you come back over here? Go back to the fuqah, you are a faqih. You want to learn fiqh, go sit with them. Why are you coming to me? And I would just keep quiet and sit in his company because I knew the Shaykh would be testing me with these words of his. He says, Once I was going with Shaykh Hamad at the bus for Salatul Jumu'ah. That day, uh, it was a winter time. It was cold. I had not performed ghusl. While we were going, we passed by the river Tigris, Dajla. And while we were crossing the river, suddenly, Sheikh Hamad stopped. I also stopped behind him. He turned around and he pushed me into the river. And I fell inside. Immediately I realized he pushed me because I have not done the ghusl of Jumu'ah. I realized my mistake. I, I just somehow got out of the river and I was wearing a jubba of of wool. It was still wet. I wore that jubba and followed Sheikh Hamad to Salatul Jumu'ah. So Sheikh had to go through these tests by his Sheikh. He would, he would say later on that Hamad tested me sometimes in very harsh way. And looking at that, some of his students also began to tease me. Because when they see that Ustad is being harsh on someone, they also start teasing him. So once Hamad uh, saw their reaction towards me, and Hamad said, don't do this to him. I am only testing him. I only tease him because I want to test him. But he is like a mountain. He never moves. Wallah, there is no one like him among you. He is the best among you.
Sheikh Hamad al Dabbas passed away in the year 525. After that, Sheikh went into the company of Sheikh Abu Sa'id al Makhrami, who was another big Sheikh in Baghdad. And he stayed in his majlis. And to the extent that when Sheikh passed away, he, he instructed the people to let Sheikh Abdul Qadir sit on his place. And Sheikh had a madrasa of his own. So Sheikh Abdul Qadir was made and the teacher of that madrasa. Now, it was at this time that people's attention is diverted towards Shaykh Abdul Qadir. And in the beginning, when he is giving out the drus in masjid, there are a few people. In the beginning, he says that maybe three, four people will be sitting with me and I would be giving my discourse and lesson among them. However, his dars gained so much acceptance in the eyes of the congregation, people started flocking towards him. And there was a time when in his lessons and his, in his speeches and discourses, there would be 400 men sitting with ink pots and noting down every word which Hazrat would be saying. There was a time when sometimes there would be 70,000 people sitting in Hazrat Sayyiduna Abdul Qadir Jilani's session. And there was a, a, a time came when nearly 5,000 Non-Muslims embraced Islam on the hands of Sayyidina Abdul Qadir Jilani. 100,000 people who were Muslim, Muslims did uh, tawbahs on the hands of Sayyidina Abdul Qadir Jilani. So this is how he reached his uh, status and he gained acceptance. And he would also go out for druz in other madaris as well. That Madrasa Nizamiya where Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was, Hazrat used to go there once a week to give dars over there as well. In this manner, Hazrat's faith spread out throughout that area. When did he get married? It is related that Hazrat's first son, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Abdul Qadir, was born in the year 508, which means that Hazrat got married two, three years before that. He used to, maybe at the age of 35, he got married. He was once asked that, Hazrat, you are a Sufi, and how come Sufi gets married? So Hazrat said, that was my thinking as well. I used to hate getting married because of the uh, things that are involved with marriage. But at the age of nearly 35, he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed him, Oh Abdul Qadir, get married. And then Hazrat says, I got married not only one, two, three, four wives. Hazrat said, Allah blessed me with such pious wives who would spend on me. I would not have to spend on them because either they were from a noble family, wealthy family, or they had some work which the ladies used to do at that time, and they had so much love for Hazrat that they would work and spend on Hazrat. And Hazrat went on to have a lot of children. 49, 27 boys and 22 girls. So Hazrat's uh, progeny and children are still alive today. Hazrat Rahmatullah had plenty of children. However, because Hazrat also uh, was blessed with a long life, not all his children uh, survived. Many passed away during his lifetime. At the time of his death in the year 561, he only had 13 children left. Others had passed away during his life. However, Hazrat was such a patient person that Hazrat would be busy in his wars or in his dars. A child would die, he would be informed. He would say, okay, ghusal karo, janaza karo. Hazrat would continue with his lesson, with his wars and his nasihat. Upon this completion, the janaza would be ready. Hazrat would go, pray janaza and busy himself with other lessons and other teaching. He, whenever a child would be born, I would take the child and do whatever is sunnah. And then I would say to myself that this child is born for death. He's going to die one day anyway. I, I will die first or he will die first. And this would help me when I would be grieved with the death uh, of one of my children. I would say to my, remind myself that when he was born, you told yourself that he's going to die. He's died. So what is there to grieve? It was an amanat and trust of Allah. Allah blessed you with the child. Allah took it when he wants to take it. So why cry and why wail and why lament? Inna lillahi wa inna ili raji'un. Allah took it back. That Hazrat Piranapi would not take any gifts from the kings or the rulers or the wealthy among the society of Baghdad. He would earn his own livelihood. He, his children, he would send them out for tijarat, business. And they would come after business and with that earning and that halal and lawful earning, whole household would uh, be taken care of. Hazrat narrates 
that once sent one of his sons with his goods for business and trade. And that journey was on the ocean and the sea through the ships. After a few days, some news arrived that that ship which was going with all that wealth was overcome by huge storm, turbulence, and it hit the rocks, and the ship was wrecked, and all the, those people on the ship died, and all the money and the property and wealth has perished. And when this news arrived, Hazrat just looked down for a little while, and then he said, Alhamdulillah. So people didn't understand. No, nobody dared to ask Hazrat, why did you say Alhamdulillah upon this instance? In those days, and the means of communication were not as good as today's. So, after a few days, the news came that the first news was false. The ship was struck by storm, and it went into towards the rocks. However, it survived, Allah saved it, and the son and all those on the ship were saved. They went to the place they were going, they did their business, and they are coming back with lots of profit and lots of wealth. So when this news arrived, again there was a sense of you know happiness and joy within the Khanqa. But when Hazrat was informed, Hazrat again looked down, and then raised his head, and he said, Alhamdulillah. Now upon this instance, someone asked Hazrat, you know this second time, you said Alhamdulillah, it is understandable, because it was good news. But the first time, the news was sad, why did you say Alhamdulillah the first time? So Hazrat said that at both instances, I did not say Alhamdulillah upon receiving that news. My Alhamdulillah was upon something else. I did not say Alhamdulillah second time because I, lots of money was coming, my son is alive. I did not say Alhamdulillah first time because I was fed up with my son and good job he's gone. Both times I said Alhamdulillah was something else. I looked of my heart, my connection with my Lord Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the first time, I pondered over my heart and I saw that Alhamdulillah, my heart has no complaint about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am thinking that whatever has happened is from Allah. But the second time, when the good news came, again, I thought that I am not jumping with joy upon receiving the good news. Uh, 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 is my heart okay? Is the connection with Allah the same as it was before? And when I looked at it, I saw that Alhamdulillah, my heart's connection was the same. I was not jumping with joy. It is upon that that I said Alhamdulillah. This is the condition of the real Sufiya Kiram. His silsila goes... Uh, to Hazrat Abu Sa'id al-Makhrami, to Abu al-Hasan al-Qurashi, from Abu al-Faraj al-Tarsusi, to Abu al-Fadl al-Taymi, from Shaykh Izzuddin. And Shaykh Izzuddin, he takes the silsila from Hazrat Shibli, and he takes it from Junaid Baghdadi, and from Sari Sakati, and from Ma'roof al-Karhi, from Dawud al-Ta'i, from Habib al-Ajami, and from Hassan al-Basri, from Ali, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the silsila of Hazrat Piran Peer, Sayyiduna Abdul Qadir Jilani rahmatullahi alayhi. Hazrat Piran Peer rahmatullahi alayhi was of a slim build, he was of medium size, but slightly tall, he had a broad chest, his beard was full, yet his voice was very uh, heavy, and it could be heard at a distance. The whole congregation would hear his voice, no no matter what amount they would be. He would sit on a high place, high throne, and all the congregation around him would be able to hear his voice. And he was very extremely healthy person. Sometimes during the winter when others are shivering from the cold, Hazrat would be sitting and he would be sweating because of the good health Allah had given him. And with regards to his akhlaq, it is written that Abu Abdullah Ishbili says that Hazrat was, his du'as were readily accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would cry very quickly. Upon the smallest instances, tears would flow from his eyes. He would be constantly engaged in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would always be pondering upon the creation and on the ni'mat and bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had a very soft and tender heart and he had a very uh, a smiling face. He would never be stubborn or arrogant. He was extremely generous person. He had lots and lots of knowledge because he had acquired it. It is narrated that once during one instance in a tafsir, he, he started doing the tafsir of one ayat and he mentioned 40 variations of the tafsir of that ayat. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani rahmatullahi alayhi is regarded as one of the greatest awliyaullah. 
one of the greatest Sufis. Now what is Tasawwuf? Let's look at the works of Hazrat Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani Ramatullah himself. One thick book called Ghunyatul Talibin. And it includes everything. Fiqhi Masail, to Aqaid, and other related Tasawwuf as well. And also al fathur Rabbani, his Majalis, Fuyuzi Yazdani. I read in the book by Dr. Abdul Razak Al Gilani that once one of, on one of his journeys or travels outside when he was alone in the desert, he, he was overcome by extreme thirst. He was tired and he was just lying down there. And suddenly, from out of nowhere, a bucket of water appears until Hazrat drinks it and his thirst is quenched. Alhamdulillah. And this is a miracle and it does happen. Now the bucket disappeared. But soon after this, it so happened that some noor or something light-like thing appeared from the clouds. And a voice came out that, O oh Abdul Qadir, I am your God and I am so happy with you that I have cancelled the Sharia Ahkam for you. You don't need to pray and you don't need to fast and every haram is halal for you and you can eat and drink freely whatever you want. And Hazrat immediately said, Tawbah, Astaghfirullah, Shaitan, Khabis, Mardud, Malwoon, you are coming here to trick me? This is not God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to abide by the Sharia. What Allah and His Rasul say, we have to go according to that. And immediately that light disappeared and clouds came over it. And that was Shaitan trying to deceive and trick. So he, he disappeared and then he called out, Oh Abdul Qadir, in this maidan and in this place, I have deceived nearly 70 awliyaullah. You were rescued and saved because of your ilm and because of your knowledge, because of your fiqh and your understanding of deen. And Hazrat replied, Tawbah astaghfirullah, what is my ilm, what is my knowledge? My knowledge can't save me, it is the fadl and grace of Allah which saved me. So people who go on to say, we are followers of awliyaullah and this is all halal and jayiz for us, they are doing the wrong thing. We should revere and respect the awliyaullah. Listen to their advices, not worship the awliyaullah, not go to their grave and worship them, do sajda in front of them. These things are haram in Sharia. Now, Hazrat Piranapi Rahmatullah was the greatest wali of Allah during his time. There is no doubt about that. He went through great sacrifices in the earlier days. In his mujahadat, it is narrated that he once said that for 40 years, I have prayed the Salah of Fajr with the wuzu of Isha. Meaning he never slept throughout the night. And for 15 years, it was my continuous habit that I used to do recite one khatam of Quran throughout the night. This was his mannerism of worship. Can we do that today? Hazrat said, a person cannot be classed as a great muttaqi and careful, cautious in matters of deen until he thinks 10 things as compulsory upon himself. That's when he will be classed as a pious and a cautious and a careful person in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, he sees that it is faraz upon me to protect my tongue from ghibat. Number two, staying away and refraining from bad thoughts about other people. Number three, refraining from making fun of other people. Number four, controlling your gaze and not looking at things which you shouldn't be looking at. Number five, always being truthful with the tongue. Number six, always remember the favors of Allah upon you and never be amazed at your own qualities. I am this, I am that, I have good family, these are all my hard work, my job, my business, my work. No, always think it's a blessing of Allah. Number seven, to spend his wealth in haq and not spend his wealth in batil. Number eight, don't take for yourself Ulu and kibr, kibr pride, haughtiness, being lofty. Don't think I am very big, I am very high. Don't be a big headed person. And number nine, being punctual of the five daily prayers in their times. And number 10, being mustaqim and steadfast upon sunnat and jama'at. Holding on to the sunnat of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and the path of the jama'atul muslimin. This is the among the 10 advices of Hazrat Rahmatullah alayhi. May Allah give us a tawfiq to practice and to understand and learn from their seerat. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.